um, especially for those who are joining us for, especially for, um, for Thornton's lecture, Mr. O'Glove's lecture tonight. So before I begin and hand it over to Mr. O'Glove, I'd like to read an introduction written for tonight's lecture by the famous CNBC senior stock commentator Herb Greenberg, who very kindly wrote this for tonight's lecture. He's sorry he can't be here, but he wish he could. So big, big thank you to Herb, and I'll now read his introduction. If I said he was a legend, Ted O'Glove would call me and give me an earful. So I won't call him a legend. Instead, in the world of investing and accounting, to anyone has been around for more than a few years, Ted O'Glove is a rock star. That's how I felt when I first met him years ago about hearing about him. He is, to put it mildly, the godfather of all things earnings quality. Along with his partner, Bob Olstein, he invented the business of trying to warn investors of what might go wrong behind that company headlines, the numbers, and company spin. His book, Quality of Earnings, The Investor's Guide to How Much Companies, how much money a company is really making is a classic. The investor's guide, or, but here's what I find interesting. A few years ago, in an interview with The Motley Fool, Ted surprised everyone. He said he no longer pays attention to the twists and turns of every footnote. In fact, he doesn't read them all that much anymore. Turns out he was onto something before many of us. The markets have changed considerably, and in a market dominated by macroeconomic events, Investors don't care about every detail of the financial statements the way they once did. Doesn't mean you shouldn't. And if I misinterpreted what Ted said, I'm sure he'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> the best part about Ted O'Glove, as you're about to find out, is that besides being brilliant, he's not impressed with himself. But you're also about to find out why those of us who know him are impressed with Ted. So thank you very much, Herb. He's not with us for the yeah. introduction. And I'll pass it over to the godfather of earnings quality. Well, <laughs> you know, what can I say, you know, today when you re read all these celebrities on, on Wall Street and so on, uh, I can't, you know, Herb Greenberg is, happens to be the best investigative reporter on Wall Street. He used to write for the San Francisco Chronicle. He had expose after expose. You could practically make a living shorting stocks. And also, once in a while, we give you a, a, a good tip on the market. I sure want to thank you all tonight for coming here. And at the end of the lecture, I know about 20% of the class participation is based on questions and so on. So the professor, I think, is going to try to call on. I'm going to try to leave enough time so every one of you could ask a question. It can be on generally accepted accounting. Uh, it can be on chapters you know, other chapters in the book. Uh, also on the stock market, the ins and outs of the market, which I'm going to go into. And also investing uh, in the best way to invest in the market. And also economics. I have a minor in economics, so I can feel most questions on economics. And I don't have time tonight to go into what would have been the last part, why economically we're going backward rather than forward compared with the depression, even though that's misleading now because the market's close to an all-time high and the economy is definitely improving. In this lecture, the parts are first the three titans of the 20th century, one corporate governess that was in the 20s, Harrison Ripley, political science professor at Harvard. Then we have Leonard Spotcheck. He was the managing partner and chairman of the board of Arthur Anderson for a number of years. And that was the public accounting. And then we have Professor Abraham Broloff, who's still alive at 95. He wrote three books on accounting, a nonstop critic of generally accepted accounting. And he's still today, what's incredible is today, he's still giving lectures. And once in a while, he still writes for Barron's Weekly. So now I'm going to go on to the professor, Harrison Ripley, is very interesting. He wrote a book, Main Street, Wall Street, and Professor Ripley used to write for the Atlantic Monthly. What's incredible is the sitting president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, used to tell his fellow citizens to read his exposés of the stock market, how it was being rigged, and so on. When he passed away in 1991, he was given credit for forecasting 
the crash, which happened in 29. Now, of course, he didn't forecast the year, but like a couple others before this latest market crash, he was right on the mark. And, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> also, <coughs> he was close to, uh, <coughs> need a cough drop here, he was close to Calvin Coolidge in the sense that he told Calvin Coolidge he shouldn't run for re-election in 1928. Now, Calvin Coolidge was a uh, overwhelming favorite to win. And what happened was in 1927, Calvin Coolidge, who was a man of few words, he called in the press corps in Washington, D.C., and he handed just slips of paper, and the paper, the slips of paper said, I choose not to run. He walked out of the room. Also, it was the fifth anniversary of the death of Warren Harding in the Palace Hotel in San Francisco in 1922, or 20, might have been 23, and his vice president, Coolidge, inherited the office. And by the way, it turned out it was Hoover that went by the landslide, the Republican, and then the deluge came, the crash. What he complained about were investment trusts. These were mutual type entities that were investing in overseas bonds, foreign bonds that became worthless, stock pools where they, a few manipulators would run the stocks up and down to the detriment of individual investors, complex holding companies that were so complex the accountants couldn't even understand the accounting, and the stocks bought on very thin margin. You could only put 10% down. You can imagine 10% down on a stock you could be wiped out literally in 10 minutes, they could call for more margin, because the stock drops 10%, they're going to want more money immediately. Uh, ever since the crash, the margin has gone up to 50%. This picture here is hard to see. Um, this is one of the most famous pictures of the Depression. This is 1932, and this man here, he's dressed in a suit, and he's buy a fairly new car, and he says $100 will buy this car, must have cash, lost all in the stock market. And millions and millions of investors, there was a mania, everybody had to invest in the stock market, and by the time the market crash was finished, where you got the market going from a high of about 350 down to 47, down about 90%, nobody had anybody left for the market. Now I'm on to the second one that has no equal in the public accounting profession. It was Leonard Spotcheck. He was chairman of the board. He was managing partner chairman of the board of Arthur Anderson between 1947 and 1963. Nobody liked him before, nobody liked him afterwards. He's just a heavyweight. He's the one that formed the, uh, the uh, accounting principles board, which is the predecessor of the Financial Accounting Standards Board. He, between 1956 and 69, he made 150 addresses, everyone critical. So this could never happen today. You're not going to have a partner of a big eight, but it's a big eight accounting firm, constantly critiquing what he regarded as lax accounting. And I just want to tell you for a minute, okay, now I'm going back to when I was a student here 50 years ago at the business school, and I was doing my thesis on the investment tax credit, which was two different ways of investing for the tax credit. And like so many rules of accounting, it was diametrically opposite. You could take millions of dollars in tax credits, you could amortize it over the life of the equipment, or you could flow it through to earnings immediately. Well, of course, most companies want to hit the bulge in earnings and they flowed it through immediately. And I called him over the phone, I'd never talked to him before, and he spent an hour on the phone. The professor, by the way, was very impressed that this distinguished personage in the public county field would talk for an hour on the phone. And then I got a letter in the mail from him with a $500 check. Now $500 in those days is like 5000 today. By the way, the tuition at the business school level is $100 per semester. That's what it was. <laughs> Give you an idea of inflation and so on. And he said that I want 50 copies of your thesis. I want to distribute them to the partners in Arthur Anderson. And then, later, when it turned out, oh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. I always had a pretty good edge on fellow analysts because, first of all, I started investing in the stock market when I was 17. 
I then became a stockbroker. Next, I went to business school. And then I was an analyst analyzing insurance companies and investment in banks. And those are the toughest, that's the toughest spirit of being an analyst in. And then I decided, you know, go in this quality of earnings type research with my then partner, Robert Olstein. So now it's 1970, and I visit Mr. Spotcheck in his office in Chicago. And he says, I want to give you a book. We just published The Search for Fairness and Reporting to the Public. And it had 50 of his addresses. And he said, I don't think you're going to wade through every one. But read the one that I delivered in 1959 to the financial accounting class, Graduate School of Business Administration, Harvard University, on accounting magic. And in accounting magic, he had a chart. And you had two corporations. Everything was identical. The corporations except the accounting. One was aggressive. The other was conservative. So one reported two dollars a share earnings. The other reported a dollar. And he said, "This is what you can do with so-called generally accepted accounting." So then I uh, told him that I had a uh, a book that I really liked. Was how to lie with statistics. This is 1954. How to lie with statistics. It's still in print. It's still sometimes referred to. And I like the, the caption here is, now you too can double talk your account and confuse your political opponent. And I told him, I said, don't you agree that this generally accepted accounting as you portray it to students at Harvard is how you lie with statistics. He says he hit it on the nail. And what's interesting in this book, there's some priceless quotes. One, Disraeli the prime, famous prime minister of England, he said there are three types of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. The next was A.G. Wells. Statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. Well, that hasn't happened. And next is Major General Artemis Ward from the Revolutionary Army. It ain't so much the things we know that get us in trouble, it's the things we know that aren't so. And when I was talking to Leonard Spotcheck, I told him, I said, well, he was also talking about price-earning ratios. And he said the company that reports $2 a share is going to earn double the one that reports a dollar. And I said, in all due fairness, I don't think that's going to happen. The market is smarter than you think. And the, the company that reports $2 a share, the price-earning ratio, that's the key. It has a lower quality of earnings. The market's going to see through it. And therefore, it will go down. It won't necessarily go where the the, the company reporting $2 won't go down maybe as far as the one reporting a dollar, but it'll go a long way down. And he was kind of puzzled by this. But he said, I understand, you know, you've developed this quality of earnings research. It's really great what you're doing. And he said, now I realize you're, what you're saying about the price-earning ratio and how that's the key and how quality of earnings can affect the price-earning ratio. And that's the whole reason Bob Olson and I went into this type of research, because if we were right, on the research we were publishing, which was described to by banks, mutual funds, investment companies, and so on, the stock, even if the earnings remain steady, the stock should go down. And that, that's what happened in many cases. Now we come to the reincarnation of Professor Ripley, which is just incredible, in the personage of Professor Abraham J. Brilloff, who was a professor of accountancy at Baruch City College in New York. And from academia, there's never been anybody more critical of the accounting profession. Just like spot check at the public sector, nobody was more, more critical. And he's, he's published three books. 1972 was Unaccountable Accounting. And he's got a passage here on materiality. Um, I did a lot of work on materiality. I think I was the first one on Wall Street to talk about immateriality and how you had all these items that were not disclosed to investors on the basis of their immaterial. Usually the guideline was 5% of the gross earnings. So you could have a company sell a plant, not give you the details of the earnings that came in from the plant, even though they might be responsible for 100% of the growth. And here's what the professor says on accounting. He says, the standard of immateriality is a catch-22 Managements and orders can evade all the other objectives and features by interposing the defense of lack of materiality. And he says the catch-22 
implication stems from the fact the APB is never defined materiality. They did put out a paper on materiality, but they never really followed through with it. I agree with the concept of immateriality because there's so many footnotes now and the statements are so cluttered that you, you, you've got to give the, uh, the accountant some, you've got to give them quite a bit of the leeway on what's material and what's immaterial. But of course, that is at the uh, expense of the investor. And then he quotes me in the Wall Street Journal, 1971. He said, Thornton O'Glove, a financial analyst, says materiality is the Achilles steel heel of the accounting profession and escape hatch for corporate managements. Uh, he goes on to say the abuse of the concept is pervasive. There are literally hundreds of public corporate audits taking place each year that contain important accounting transactions that aren't revealed due to the Alice in Wonderland judgment and materiality exercised by the large, large portion of the accounting fraternity. Now we go on to 1976. He writes, More Debits Than Credits. I love the subtitle, The Burnt Investor's Guide to Financial Statements. Talking about the reincarnation of Professor Ripley, what Broloff did, and still does to a degree, and the Atlantic Monthly has disappeared, but he writes for Barron's, which is a weekly publication. And when he would write, he was such a powerful force as a critic that sometimes when people would open Barron's on Monday, some of the stocks would start plummeting, or he would affect a whole industry, like land development companies were a fad. He wrote them up. He said, taking in 20 years of earnings in one year, which is legal. Um, this means they're going to have to sell more and more home sites. The industry will collapse. And from the time he wrote this up, it did collapse. Also, when I met him in 1968, he talked about the conglomerates. And the conglomerates were the fad of the day. These were, a lot of, a lot of them were small, medium, large. But the common theme was to make acquisitions. You keep making acquisitions, you automatically increase your earnings. But in this case, they gave out a lot of preferred stock, convertible bonds. And under the counting rules, they didn't have to tell you how diluted they were when they were converted. So here, somebody had a company earning $2 a share, but it might only earn $1 a few years later when everything is converted. And he goes on to say about the big eight, which is now the big four. They are allies of corporate management. They've compromised their public responsibility. He also chastises the self-regulatory body, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Very colorful writer, nobody like him. So one, one chapter here, he starts out the gap, in gap, which is the gap in generally accepted accounting principles. Oh, here's another one. Accounting for revenues before they're hatched. Well, I think you're studying diamond foods. There's a great example. His last book, the Truth About Corporate Accounting, this uh, came out in 1981, and here again, it's almost priceless the way he starts the first chapter, named We Often Paint Fakes. Um, I know um, Professor Lawrence has taken, has studied quite a bit, you know, accounting principles, permissive accounting, lax accounting. I don't know what he thinks if accounting is going to become even more, more lax. Uh, my own opinion is strongly, over the years, it's become more and more permissive. It's ingrained. It's part of the financial network. The stakes are huge. I don't know anybody complaining about bad accounting. Now, Winter Spotcheck, when he gave that speech at Harvard, he also said, like a prophet, he said, like Gresham's Law, Bad accounting will drive out good accounting. Just like the silver dollar, I think there's something, a relative in my room has a silver dollar in this room from 1972, it was worth one dollar. Silver now is going up 40 to one, so it's worth $40. That's what they mean by Gresham's Law. Um, political pressure is, is unrelenting. The, uh, there was a rule there was a rule on mark to market. This is about March 09, where Barney Frank held hearings on accounting, and the Financial Accounting Standards Board was there. And this had to do with value, when you value, 
valuation of illiquid assets such as mortgage securities and the Financial Accounting Board wanted to tighten up the rules. But the, the corporations, of course, wanted to bend the rules. And on mark to mark, here you got, I still remember, I happened to see on television, you got Hens, who's the head of the, or the chairman of the Financial Accounting Sales Board. He's testifying before Barney Frank, and Barney Frank now is staring down at him. And he says, I'm going to give you people three weeks to amend what you're doing. And we're talking about amending it literally. And that's just how bad it is. Of course, there's a lot of political pressure you don't hear about. So some of these accounting rules are bent um, without the, the person really being that knowledgeable. OK, now we go to part two. Um, don't trust your analyst. Now, there's a whole chapter here why you can't trust the analyst. The, the analyst is in a bad spot. He works for investment bank or whatever. They usually do an underwritings. Um, if he publishes negative research, he may be in a small graveyard of ex-analysts. And sometimes you may find the head of the corporation, which is the target, will call up, go right to the top, call up the head of the, the firm, financial firm, and say, we're not going to put you in underwritings anymore. Or what he says is, we're not, when we have an underwriting, we're not going to have you participate. And you have Don Trump. He was practicing up for The Apprentice. You were fired, and he did fire a security analyst some years ago. It was an entertainment analyst. He wrote about the bonds at Taj Mahal Casino in Atlanta. He says these bonds are fraught with risk. Uh, Don Trump, a world-class egomaniac, didn't like it. And he called up the analysts, and he said, you don't know it yet, but you're fired. And sure enough, one week later, and this had to do with, I think, Roth Securities. He was an entertainment analyst in, based in Philadelphia. And they fired him a couple weeks ago, um, or maybe it was a couple months ago, Bank of New York got rid of an analyst who was too too critical. You've got to realize these analysts are sometimes they're wine and dine by management. They have conference calls. The company will shut you out of the conference calls. They may swear at you. You have the scaling of Enron. Sometimes would swear at analysts when they'd ask them about the off-balance sheet entities. And then you had that guy from Sunbeam, I forget his name, he would even curse analysts publicly. By the way, there's a dead giveaway. The few times that publicly corporate management has chastised somebody in the audience asking a critical question, invariably that stock is going south quickly. Now we're on to the auditor. There's some interesting anecdotes here. There's some are in the book, but th here's one for the ages. I'll go on to Madoff first. The whole key to Madoff was the accountant, the outside accountant. We're talking about an independent accountant was in his hip pocket for all those years, signing off on Madoff statements. It was an accounting firm that nobody in the world ever heard of because it was a two-man firm. It was based in White Plains, New York, in a strip mall. Now, you can imagine the SEC, several times they would audit the books of Madoff and they wouldn't want to, want to interview the accountant. One of the first things you want to do is interview the accountant. And even the whistleblower at the end, he, he was writing all these letters to the SEC, and he said, this is a Ponzi scheme. He was a, this uh, personality, Matamopoulos, I think. He, uh, he said the, the split strike investment policy of Madoff cannot be. You cannot get 1% per month regardless. And here again, it, it's just, I asked Professor Broff, some, sometimes I still talk to Professor Broff, I said, how on earth would they not view this? The first thing you want to do, or if I had been investigating the SEC and so on, I didn't want to see who the outside order was. I would have been startled that this man, by the way, who was once head of the NASDAQ, he also had 9% of all the trading volume over the counter on the 18th floor and on the 19th floor where everything was rigged and nobody was permitted to go. But the SEC, what they should have done is all you had to know who this auditor was, 
and then you send in the FBI to seize all the records overnight, and the game would have been up years before it was. I just find it incredible. Now, here's another one on audit treachery, and this is the part of an outside order. Here we got Arthur Anderson here, and Robert Olsen and I are publishers of the Quality of Earnings Report. We're employed by Conan Company, a small investment bank in New York, and our outside order is Arthur Anderson. And what happened was one day he asked us for the research on ITT. We were always writing about ITT, which was the General Electric of the day. And Harold Janine presided over um, ITT. He was considered a managerial genius. Their earnings were fully managed. He owned almost everything. There was no, it didn't matter what the economy was doing. He could always come in with his 10% stated increase in earnings. And we were critiquing the lower quality of earnings, the price earning ratio was beginning to come down. Uh, the New York Times interviewed us on their accounting. Uh, they said, suppose you could interview Hal Janine, what would you ask him? So we put together 19 accounting questions. This appeared in New York Times. Uh, ITT was under fire because of Chile and they were involved with the CIA. And uh, one day the communist head of Chile was assassinated by Pinochet, who was the, uh, the general that took over, and senators, we received eight letters alone from U.S. senators, they don't know anything about journaling except the county, but they thought there was fraud involved, and we had to send them a note back to each senator saying, there's no fraud involved, it's just part of the journal accepted accounting, and to make their 10%. So here's what happens. Uh, one day, Dale Cohen gets a phone call from somebody, one of the auditors involved with ITT, and they said, we want to meet you with some accountants and complain about the research, which should be stopped. So who comes over? First of all, our own outside order comes over to complain to the chairman of the board, Dale Conan, about our research. And who comes with them? The outside order. Can you imagine the outside order of Arthur Anderson comes, also the head of international accounting, and then they fly in a managing partner. I still remember his name from Chicago. He was an accounting guru. And now they're talking to Dale Conan. And they don't realize, you know, first of all, the head of Arthur Anderson now is Harvey, Harvey Kapnick. Harvey Kapnick had sent a letter to Dale Cohen congratulating him on employing us, this type of research. The head of the SEC was somebody named Summers, another friend of Dale Conan. We knew that the chief accountant of the SEC personally he wanted our research. We couldn't give it to him because of conflict of interest. So anyway, they depart. And I think we come out with another negative research, research report on ITT. So now comes the letter. This is a classic from Herbert Norch. I still remember the name. He was the comptroller of ITT. And he writes to Mr. Cohn. He says, we are not unaware that our accountants came over to talk to you. I love that. The chief financial officer of this company, of this huge giant thing, we're not aware. What they didn't realize was this is a rare case where pressure really wasn't going to work. What he said, what he said in the letter was, if this continues, we're going to go to the SEC. So this gave us a great opportunity. We had Dale Conan send a letter out, and we said we would be very happy to be meeting with you at the SEC. It would have been quite a meeting. They weren't doing anything illegal. It just would have been they would have been humiliated in front of the head of the SEC, the chief auditor of the SEC, and so on. And maybe the SEC would have slowed them down because a few years ago, in a rare situation, they chastised General Electric for overly, overly managing your earnings. And by the way, you're not supposed to overly manage the earnings. It's very rare that it's ever enforced. So that was the end of that. And now we go on to person to person, a shareholder's letter. And I don't know if you're reading this letter, it's a masterpiece. Here again, Warren Buffett is an investment genius, the world's best. If you invested in Berkshire Hathaway when he first started out, he managed funds himself. Then he bought a knitting mill called Berkshire Hathaway. And he told the investors, I'll either cash you out, or I'll give you stock in Berkshire Hathaway, I'm going to acquire companies. Well, 18,001, that's how much the stock went up, 18,001. Um, Nobody will know how many multi-millionaires there are, how many billionaires have been created from Berkshire Hathaway. 
you got an amazing example of a professor from Brooklyn Polytechnic College who passed away about 10 years ago. He invested $50,000 with Buffett when Buffett first started with Berkshire Hathaway, and he left $800 million. $800 million, and he had no children, and he left most of it to Brooklyn Polytechnic College, which goes back to 1856, and it turned out that amount of money was more than the whole endowment in all those years. Kind of a side story here. Now, when you read this shareholder's letter, unlike almost anybody else, and it goes on for about 20 pages, he tells you every positive, but also he tells you every negative. Um, Warren Buffett does not talk to analysts. He does not really want to talk to analysts. He's not concer concerned about earnings per share. He doesn't talk to institutional investors, no matter how much stock they may own, of Berkshire Hathaway, which is very smart because, see, he's self-confident. He's a world-class collector of businesses. He owns 60 different businesses, including Seas Candy, among them, uh, Geico, General Re. It just goes on and on. And then he also is a collector of world-class blue chip companies like Coca-Cola, the Washington Post. He owned Gillette before it was merged. He owned Wrigley. And then he merged Wrigley, I think, into Mars Chocolate. It goes on and on. So there, if you really want to look at a rare example, because here's what I'm saying. The corporate annual report, in essence, is a contract between the company and shareholders. But like any contract, it's one-sided. Remember, whoever gives you a contract is one-sided. It's that simple. The contract's written in their favor. So the corporation is putting their best foot forward with the shareholders' letter, which is usually hype. The footnotes are very opaque. Very, very opaque. Some of them. Some of them are not clear. Uh, the SEC's never demanded that it's presented in English, clear English, even though after the Enron scandal, they made an attempt. Okay, now I'm going on to part of this book here. You see all these chapters you've been reading, but you know what it's really about. Um, if you take anything out of this lecture tonight, it's differential analysis. The whole thing is just differential analysis, which is an art, it's not a science. Very few can master it fully. Um, it's hard to explain, but first of all, when you look at these footnotes, or you look at dialogue, you've got to put on a negative hat, because if you're a perennial optimist, or you look, you're, if you're very optimistic, and this is where the analysts get caught with corporate management. See, what they'll do, they'll take negative research or negative remarks on the corporation, and they'll talk to the chief financial officer, and the chief financial officer will wander that research. No matter how penetrating and accurate the research is, but by the time the chief financial officer is through, this analyst will be turned the way positive. He'll be, he, was, he turns negative, he'll be turned back positive. Um, I'm going to give a couple of great examples here of financial deviation analysis, but let me just take a side here on the San Francisco 49ers. Now, if I was writing another book, and I can't do it now, I'm not that, I wish I was the owner, it would be labeled deviation analysis, a better a way of a better life. And this would cover medical, medical, records, contracts, you name it. I'm going to give you an example on the 49ers, which most people haven't caught. Harborough, the great coach, lost that last playoff game with the Giants. And I'll tell you how he lost it. There are a few sports writers caught it. Um, he lost it first early in the season when he played Morgan, who in five minutes to go, they were ahead by about 30 points. He shouldn't have, in running up the score, he should have not had his top receivers there at all. Now, Morgan suffered a career, um, he suffered an injury, he was out for the season. And they would have desperately needed him in those playoff games when they were practically down to one receiver. They would have won that game against the Giants, they had Morgan. But more importantly, what he did was he played a player named Williams, who suffered from concussions. He had three or four concussions. Williams was a good return runner on punts and kickoffs, but he should have been benched because in the Ram game, this is the, the last game of the season, which they had to win for home field advantage, Williams was benched, but he wasn't hurt. 
So why did he play Williams in the playoffs? And here's what happens in that last game in the playoffs. Williams is trying to field a punt, and it hits him, and therefore, instead of falling on the ball, it hits him, then continues to go on. So now the Giants have the advantage, and they go on to score a touchdown. And then, lo and behold, instead of benching him, then he's back again in overtime, and he is hit hard and fumbles the ball, and then the Giants catch a field goal. Now, how can I prove this out, if you don't believe me? First, I know an old player that played with the 49ers, and he also was a coach with the Dallas Cowboys. And I talked to him about this, and he says he doesn't understand why the guy played. Also, um, let's see, I'm just trying to get my... Okay, that's enough on the 49ers. I just aside here trying to tell you how this deviation analysis my son complains you're deviating too much from the basic <laughs> lecture now here's some great examples of deviation analysis but back to Bernard Madoff and there was this feeder fund and with Bernard Madoff by the way he was a legend he really was a legend and people would beg just to invest money with them the Palm Beach uh, country club members would become members of the club because the his not his son or maybe it was his son-in-law was a member of the club and they would go to him to try to get access to Madoff that's how famous he became although it wasn't known to the public so in this 65 billion dollar gross Ponzi scheme which is the largest in history is all about a man that really knew nothing about investing, he knew about making markets, and I don't know why he went into this, because he was a multi-millionaire. Nobody's ever come out with a story, a multi-millionaire already, why is he bothering with managing money? So now he starts managing money, and he's just doing it on a regular basis, but pretty soon, like other Ponzi schemes, he has to get more and more money in there to pay off some of the people who want their money back. And that's what a Ponzi scheme is about, named for Ponzi in the 20s, who would, he would give you 12% interest on your money, and he failed when there were more people around no longer desired the 12%, they thought the risk was too high, and the game was over. So I read a feeder fund prospectus. People have no idea what was involved here. You had funds that would collect money for Madoff, and they might give it to another fund, then another fund, then the fund would finally give it to Madoff, and all of them were raking money off the top on this. And I looked at this uh, feeder fund brochure. This was in, in 2008. By the way, Madoff turned himself in and was arrested in December 2008. In the red flags, you've got to realize, when I looked at this, this didn't really involve financials, but there was a lot of deviation analysis here. I'm just giving you an example. For example, it was leverage. He, he, they were leveraging you three times. You don't leverage fixed income three times. That's very dangerous, using this leverage. Um, also, very interesting here. Who would notice the administrator, auditor, and legal counsel? Who would care where they come from? I claim that the auditor, the administrator, risk management is offshore. In the Bermuda Islands, Cayman, Cayman Islands, Antigua, watch out because there's enough problems in the United States than having those important entities in tax havens. And the legal counsel said USA, but the others were blank. They didn't say USA. So right away, I assume they were offshore. And then um, the risk, this, this is a good one, the risk management oversight office was in Bermuda. They told you flatly the risk management oversight office is in Bermuda, but why not when you consider that this was a Ponzi scheme and he didn't want too much scrutiny. Finally, they presented a chart that gave you a 16 months return, month by month. But however, they told you that you were going to get 12%. You would get about 12% return in 12 months, but it took 16 months of graphs to get 12%. And in some of those months, they were actually losing money. So one key there was, you look at all these bar charts, and they have to have 16 perform 16 months performance to get to 12. That that's a great story I think on Madoff that most people don't realize. All these people invested with Madoff 
could have seen the same thing, but they really didn't want to do it. Now here's another one in run in the year 2000. Um, Arthur Anderson, the auditor. This was the demise of Arthur Anderson. Arthur Anderson already was like a rogue auditor. They've been heavily censured by the SEC over waste management. Um, the consulting arm was putting a lot of pressure on the accounting arm because the consulting arm was making a lot more money. So Arthur Anderson um, we had to do more and more permissive accounting. The irony here is after Arthur Anderson was criminally indicted and had to go out of business, what happens to the consulting arm? The consulting arm becomes a censure, censure, which is a blue chip stock, and it's quadrupled since it went public about eight years ago. Now Enron had a footnote, but look where the footnote is. See, one problem in analyzing these companies is how many pages can you read? Because you don't know where something's buried. If you get a 10K that's 200 pages of a banker insurance company, who, I myself, if I was still on Wall Street, I could not go through 200 pages of a 10K looking for some buried island. In this case, the annual report, um, they had a certain type of debt buried under capitalization. They had some of the worst kind of debt which had price triggers. Now Enron, at the time, was $100 a share. This is in 2001. They had debt that if the price of the stock fell from $50 to $35, the creditors could ask to have, have it rearranged or whatever. I don't think they would have put them in bankruptcy, but Enron was already under so much pressure then, the fact that the, the bankers would have had them rewrite their loan covenants would have been enough to destroy the company anyway. And this is under capitalization, this footnote. And the footnote said Enron entered into financial contracts that included price triggers if Enron's price fell below prices range from $55 to $28 a share. Now, here's what happened. This is sort of incredible. I still remember this. Jeff Skelling, who had taken over Enron about a year before Ken Lay retired, or I don't know if he actually left Enron. Skelling when the price was 40 of Enron, left the company voluntarily. I've never heard of a, uh, in a major corporation, a top individual you know, running the company, citing the price of the stock. He only did it once with the Wall Street Journal. He interviewed the Wall Street Journal. He's almost in panic. He said, one reason I is, I'm leaving is because of the price of the stock. And all you had to do now is connect the dots because he was leaving because he read his own footnote. Yeah, that's right. And shortly afterwards, um, it only lasted about, you didn't have much time. The problem is, and the stock is already 80, 90, 100, and are you going to sell at 35 on a sinking stock? Most people just go down with the ship, you know, if you're not an institutional investor. Now, here's another interesting item on Enron that I don't think anybody really has come up with. No big deal. Capitalized software, giant like Enron does not capitalize software. Software is an expense. You can go either way. You can capitalize it or expense it. But a company like that would normally expense it. Lo and behold, on a dollar share, 10 cents a share of the earnings, and that was 100% 100, 100 of the growth of Enron, from 90 cents to a dollar, was capitalized software right there. There enough was reason to sell the stock without going further because the stock was selling at 100 times earnings. So this is another example of deviation analysis. Um, I can go on to Hewitt Packard. This is interesting. Hewitt Packard, um, that company's had so many different chief executive officers. They've run the company into the ground, literally. And one way they ran the company in the ground was on research. R&D, this giant, and this is in Barron's, they went from to 6%, 6% R&D to about two and three quarters. And this is in about eight years. And as Barron says, in order to make the earnings, this shows the extent that a corporation will go to, they, they'll skin on research, and what happened was Hewlett Packard only spending about half on research as competitors are spending. And now we have Meg Whitman, it's interesting, when she first took over, from Hewitt Packard a few months back, 
in the press conference, and Herb Greenberg took note of this, he, he said, how bold are they now on permissive accounting? Meg Whitman was gloating over the fact that she would now make her numbers. She said Hewitt Packard was not making the quarterly numbers, but she would make them. And lo and behold, about a month ago when Hewitt Packard reported its earnings, no, she did not make the numbers because Meg Whitman now has discovered that she's going to have to have a long-term plan here to increase the R&D, and the R&D is going to penalize earnings, and she's now talking about a five-year plan instead of quarterly earnings. Another example. And then there is a, uh, a newsletter called Red Flags in the Stock Market, and this just came out on Bank of America, and Bank of America went from negative income to positive income, and the way they did it was they just reported lower loss reserves. It's, it's incredible what you can do with your loss reserves. You're a bank or insurance company. By the way, when you have a good year, you want to over-reserve. You want to save something for later. They're drawing down on their reserves, and this made their earnings, and Wall Street fell for it, and the stock is going about three points, three points more. Okay, the next is internal controls. And I, Professor Lawrence, I think, has done quite a bit with internal controls. And it's so critical. Suppose you really knew what state the internal controls were of a corporation, a publicly held corporation, the risk management, part of that. But you don't know. It's non-transparent. They can't afford to tell you. One of the problems is they're too big to manage. These banks insurance companies, many other entities are just too big to manage. And the internal controls may be in very bad shape. Notice when they talk about stress tests on banks, the one thing they don't tell you is how are the internal controls? Well, the internal controls aren't so good. That's one reason why these banks were failing until the Federal Reserve bailed them out. Once you mention one kind of negative comment about your internal controls, you can forget it. Your stock may drop 50%. Now, a good example, one accountant, Price Waterhouse with AIG, AIG, for a couple of years, Price Waterhouse didn't give him a qualified opinion, but Price Waterhouse questioned the adequacy of the internal controls. And I think it was about 2008, they were kicked out. Can you imagine? They didn't give a qualified opinion. Price Waterhouse, probably the best order in the big four, is now kicked out of the outside audit because they hadn't had this dialogue and it turned out they were right on and this is a rarity. This is a collector's item. Professor Lawrence will be looking at this one about the comment on internal controls. A real, just a, like an outlier kind of. Now, as proof of what I'm saying, you think I'm a little bit too negative on this, Barron's had an interview with a former um, Commissioner of the SEC, she now teaches at Brooklyn Law School. Her name is Roberta Carmel. And it's priceless what she has to say, but it's 100% it's true. She says, we have to eliminate the problem that comes with too big to fail. That is socializing losses and privatizing profits. Such a system is just not in the nature of the capitalistic ideal. And then, this is the key right here, like the utilities of old. Financial holding companies today have become large, complex, opaque, and highly risky in large part through the use of leverage and off-street, off-balance sheet accounting. Now back in the 30s, there was a, a head of the largest public utility company in America account for about 30% of the electrical power and too complex to analyze by anybody a holding company that collapsed during the Depression, 600,000 shareholders lost everything. Samuel Insull was the president of the company. He was indicted for fraud and other crimes. Unlike today, you did have a big wheat indicted. I don't know anybody today of any magnitude, of any bank, corporation, whatever, during this latest financial debacle who's been criminally tried. We're talking about criminally tried. There have been a few in lower down, lower, lower echelon. In 1935, they passed the Public Utility Act. In 1935, this broke up the complex utility companies. Also in the 30s, they had the Glass-Siegel Act passed, which broke up the banks 
in investment companies, and lo and behold, 1999, the Glass-Siegel Act is repealed. And so now, banks could take over investment companies, investment companies take over banks, and this led to more and more leverage. And one key reason you had these failures. Um, also, lobbyists. There were no real lobbyists in the 30s. There was the elite. The elite ran things, a handful of people at the top. Today, there are 15,000 full-time lobbyists, 15,000 up from 10,000 a few years ago. Uh, I could offer everybody in this room a $1,000 reward if they could Google up any congressman, any senator who has run for re-election on one principle of trying to get rid of the lobbyists or trying to curtail the influence of the lobbyists. You're not going to find such a thing because the lobbyists provide the campaign money. And these lobbyists, they go right up to the offices of the legislators, they wine and dine them and so forth. And that's why today this, this sad Congress, which has 11% approval rating as a whole, we're talking about as a whole, they're down to 11%. Used car sales are maybe down to 9 the the uh, the lobbyists, for example, a good example is Dodd Frank, which is another creation of a guy like Frank and a guy like Dodd, and just for public consumption, they put together this massive so-called financial reform bill that Sheila Blair, the former commissioner of the Federal Deposit Insurance Commissioner, said is Rube Goldberg. But what's happened now in recent weeks? It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Now they're watering down the bill already. The bill was just passed. It's hard to understand. It's going to be impossible to minister anyway. But this gives you a great example of what goes on. The lobbyists are always there. When Barney Frank held those hearings on Mark to Market County, 800 bankers showed up. Thousands of letters come in the mail. So that's the, one of the sad facts of life. Oh, and finally, about general accepted accounting, again, I, I don't know anybody, any investment manager, um, corporate head, anybody from the SEC, President of the United States, Coolidge did take some interest in the economy. Uh, he was not an economic idiot like most of them today. And what you have is they just don't have the, the, the economic knowledge they, they, you know, they pass these bills, but they're just very flawed economically. Now I'm going to part three here. On, this is very interesting on the stock market. And what's the key of the stock market? And why is it so futile to try to, everyone wants to try to predict the market, invest in the market, and so on. And what is the market going to do tomorrow? What are the individual stocks going to do tomorrow? And people ask me, and I say, well, it's very simple. I can tell you what it's going to do if you tell me what the corporate earnings are going to be and also what the price earning ratio is going to be. Is the price earning ratio going to be 10? It could be 90 times earnings. Um, what about inflation? Higher inflation will, will negatively impact the price earning ratio. Also, who's president of the United States? That can make quite a difference. Who's president of the United States? I'm going to go into this pretty soon. Also, interest rates. Well, if interest rates go up, usually you're going to get a very low market. We're under Jimmy Carter. Rates, Treasury rates went up to an incredible 15%. And the Dow Jones, the price earning ratio of Dow Jones was down to six times earnings. Never happened before in history, other than that one year in 1932 where there were no earnings in the Dow. The Dow had a 50 cent minus. Um, so that is really the key, the critical price earning ratio. However, for long term investing and for ordinary investing, I would still lean very heavily on the price earning ratio. Obviously, the higher the price earning ratio, the more risky the investment can be, but it could be years before the price earning ratio comes down. You have the example of Cisco Systems during the dot com boom, got up to 100 times earnings. Then, went steadily downward about 10 times earnings. It's just absolutely incredible how they slowed down, of course. Oh, another thing uh, Cisco did, talk about using generally accepted accounting. Have you ever heard of a corporation for 32 consecutive quarters earn one penny more than Wall Street expected? 32 consecutive quarters. Now, statistically, the odds of that 
or what, 100,000 to one, whatever, they never failed to deliver that extra penny. And it really worked. And then Broff comes, and he happens to catch Cisco near at high at Barron's. He's writing up Cisco, making extra earnings through acquisitions, but the dot-com boom just leveled all those stocks. And what happened at the dot-com boom, which was in the late 90s and early 2000, the market already tripled, but the multiples were way too high. They, it wasn't only the dot-com companies. A lot of, most of them didn't have any earnings. But hundreds and hundreds were going public. Wall, Wall Street had dropped its, its underwriting standards. But General Electric was selling at 40 times earnings, which was way too high. Intel was selling at 40 times earnings. Just, you know, large corporations were selling for quite a bit. What Intel was doing is they were making their earnings by selling off pieces of venture capital companies they invested in. And Wall Street took those earnings at full value. It's just incredible how for a while these analysts and these investors, this is one reason why they don't want accounting reform because they just want the earnings no matter where they come from. Until that com time comes from somebody out there, I don't know who it is, I'm going to talk about this later, how this market has an uncanny ability to predict before we can, before humans. Um, therefore, you should take all market forecasts with a grain of salt. Now, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's top lieutenant at the 2004 Berkshire Annual Meeting, he said people have this craving to have someone tell them the future. Long ago, kings would hire people to read cheap guts. There's always been a market of people who pretend to know the future. Listening to today's forecast is crazy as when the king hired the guy to look at the sheep guts. It happens over and over again. Now, before I talk more about the market, I'm just going to talk more about some history that involves the stock market. Uh, One Single Conda was a best-selling book published in 1969 by John Brooks, a brilliant historian. Where did he get the name Gokanda? He says, Gokanda is now a rune. It was a city in southeastern India where, according to legend, everybody passed through got rich. He said, this is exactly what people thought would happen that got down to Wall Street or invested in the market between, you know, in the 20s. Um, he talked about Richard Whitney. Um, that was a shock when Richard Whitney, the old guard, of the financial stock exchange and so on, was indicted for embezzlement. He goes to prison. Now on to, in other words, John Brooks, the go-go years. And he talks about the 60s now. You had a big bull market in the 60s, driven by conglomerates, creative accounting, Chinese money. He's talking about the acquisitions using convertibles. Um, New issues. That was the golden age of the new issues. You all see new issues and you hear about Facebook and so on. But in the 60s, when I was a stockbroker, they would have all these new issues coming out for the first time. Some of them were famous names. I still remember Andrew Jerkins, McDonald's, Hamburger, Howard Johnson. But many of them shouldn't have really gone public, even though they all did have earnings. One thing the underwriters required were earnings, which they didn't require during the dot-com boom. You had Bowie now, he's going public. Franchising became a rage. Not only did the franchises go public, but the franchisees sometimes would go public. Now, the last one here, I'm, I'm talking about a book, is The Number. This is a brilliant book, The Number, written in 2003 by Alex Berenson. This is really what's the final, if, if spot check was around the day, I'd send this book right away because the Gresham's Law reached its zenith. How the drive for corporate earning, quarterly earnings corrupted Wall Street and corporate America. And you've got to realize this is the advent of the stock options coming on. The tax rules were changed. We're in favor being paid in stock options rather than over a million dollars in salary. We had these outlandish bonuses based on earnings per share. And the punchline here is what he says, the numbers offer a unified vision of how today's accounting scales reflect a broader system failure. As long as investors remain too focused on the number, companies will find ways to manipulate it. Of course, that is very true. And here's a quote, Upton Sinclair. Uh, 
he was a socialist and he ran for senator in California in the 20s. This is great. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. And this is where Lehman Brothers comes in. The guy running Lehman Brothers, when they asked him, they said, they asked him, do you ever, the Lehman Brothers collapsed, the internal controls, lack of risk, proper risk management did him in, too much leverage. But the guy running it, they asked him, do you ever talk to the head of internal controls and so on, risk management? He never did, never bothered to go there. You wonder how many others are like that. Now I'm going to go on to an unpublished paper here, read just a little bit about the amazing fluctuations of the price earning ratio in the market. I've always invested mainly through price earning ratio rather than cash flow or price to cash. And it turns out Merrill Lynch did a study years ago and they looked at 50 stocks in the Standard Poor's 500 stock index. And they looked at returns through 1986 through 2002. And they looked at price to sales, price to cash flow, and so on. And of course, price earning ratio. It turned out, looking at price earning ratio only, you got a return of 17% versus 13% price to sales and price to book 12%. You gotta be careful here, because once in a while you get a company like Berkshire Hathaway, it's only selling at 1.10 book, which makes it probably the cheapest stock in America, and Warren Buffett's always encouraged investors to look at the book value, not the, not the, uh, the share earnings, because of the, of the structure of the company. Different segments of the market sell at different price earning ratios. That makes it more difficult to analyze. Technology usually is gonna sell at a higher price earning ratio in other groups. Utilities will usually sell lower. Investor psychology. What about investor psychology having to do this? Why you can't predict it is, can you predict investor psychology up and down? Who can really predict that in the future? The market knows, but we do not. John Bogle, who is the founder of the Vanguard Mutual Fund Complex, he's the founder investing through indices. He says, time and time again, the market moves up and down in anticipation of some future condition the investment crowd does not recognize till after the fact. This is a maxim which I subscribe and once confirmed by the stock market's behavior over time. The bull market of the 20s, from a low of 64 in 1921, it topped out at 381 in October 29, October 1929. It fell maybe 50 points in one day. That was the start of the crash. But meanwhile, look what happened. The Dow earnings per share went up tenfold. So that market was being supported by corporate earnings. However, who knew corporate earnings were in collapse, see? And the gross national product of the co company, of the country, rose by 50%. Now comes the crash, 1929 crash, and the Dow winds up going from 381 in October of 29 to an incredibly low 41 in the Depression year 1932. And also, the gross national product dropped by about 40%. How did the market know this? How did the market steadily go downward during the way it had a 50% rally? from where it was, way before it hit the low, and a lot of more other people became entrapped in the market with a 50% rally. How did the market know that the absolute low industrial production was 1932, which it was? The market never went any lower than the industrial production went. Amazing, I just find it incredible. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in 32. Just coincidentally, as he's elected president, the Dow hits bottom. The Dow puts on the biggest percentage rally in its history. It goes from about 40 to 200 in three years, 40 to 200. But nobody had the money to participate. That's the key. And then from 200, it went down to 100 because the economy began to sag again. Oh, here's another one. Uh, World War II, the Battle of Midway, June 1942. The American market, when World War II the World War started in 1939. America's war started in December 
1941. Six months later is the Battle of Midway. Why did the market reach its low at the Battle of Midway, even though in hindsight now, it was a battle of carriers, aircraft carriers, and the Japanese lost half their carrier fleet. They lost four carriers in one day, and their naval arm was never the same. It set them back it set them back in such a way that maybe the war would have lasted two years longer in the Pacific. But the market reached its low at the Battle of Midway and went up 60%. Between Midway and the end of the war, August 1945, market going up 60%. Uh, look at the example of Eisenhower here. President Eisenhower took office. His term was 52 to 60. This is an example I did research on the influence of American presidents on the market. There's many other factors, but I took price-earning ratio. Well, here you, the price-earning ratio doubled. He took office at 10 times earnings, which was a bargain. He left office at 19 times earnings, but corporate earnings hardly went up. I can't, can't understand that either. They went from $27 to $32 a share. So mainly on the doubling the price-earning ratio, the market increased by over 100%. Now, it turns out, um, of course, he's an underrated president, but presidential scholars now rank him seventh. Uh, the Korean War was going on and for two years, and he got rid of the war within six months. So that, that was a big help right there. It's interesting. Eisenhower now leaves office, and the stock market price-earning price earning mobile was never the same for 18 years. In a way, it was right, because after Eisenhower left office, now the Vietnam War started up. From a handful of advisors, we wound up with 600,000 troops at the high in Vietnam in about, I think maybe it was about 1968, something like that. Inflation, because of the war, and President Johnson, who took over from Kennedy, Kennedy was assassinated within a couple of years of taking office, Johnson, so-called guns and butter, he didn't raise taxes. He didn't want to pay for the war through taxation. He didn't really cut spending. So this marked the start of more and more inflation. And what's amazing here is from John Kennedy's first year in office, the price earning ratio hit a new high of 22 from 19 when Eisenhower left. And in 1979, when Carter was president and he had this raging inflation taking place, the Dow Jones ratio bottom at seven times earnings, 6.8 times earnings. Just to give you another example, who can predict these twists and turns in the market based on price earning ratio? Clinton was very favorable for the market, but he happened to be in his eight years in office. Uh, there was no war to speak of, and we had a very good economy. The Dow Jones average went from 3,700 to 10,700, gained them almost 300. And the corporate earnings doubled. You see what the interplay here is? Corporate earnings doubled during his eight years, and the price earning ratio went up 50%. And that led to a triple in the market. Then, when you had the dot com bust, and you had the regular price earning mobile bust, the market in 2000 reached its high of 11,700, then it bottomed out. It's 7,200. A recent great example is, how would the market know in March 2009 when the Dow had fallen from 14,000, about 100, down to 6,500, went down to 6,500, it was cut in half. All the stock indices went down more than half. How does the market know, and what we know now, that was the bottom of the economy. The absolute bottom of the economy was March 2009. And the market's never stopped going up. The market's now doubled since 2009, but the economy slowly and slowly is recovered and getting better now. Also, another thing that happened around March 2009, in that period, it was apparent, but apparent now with hindsight, the, uh, the Federal Reserve was going to save everything. There was nothing that was too big to fail, literally, whether it be General Electric, General Electric, would have failed because the finance arm had overborrowed, and they were in the commercial paper market, and now the Federal Reserve bailed out the commercial paper market. Uh, General Electric bought a bank so they could get in on bank bailouts. American Express was allowed to borrow 
the big credit card companies allowed to borrow very low interest rates. Um, they poured money into every bank that needed to be saved. And what's lost in sight is the guarantees. There were trillions and trillions of dollars of guarantees. They guaranteed the money market mutual fund industry. Like I say, they wound up guaranteeing the high grade commercial paper industry. Um, they engaged later in quantitative easing where you got artificially low rates because the government is buying up treasuries and mortgages, so the rates are very low. This has helped the stock market a lot in American business and of course has helped the banks uh, to a very, very large degree. Okay, now I'm going to go on to we've got plenty of time left for the black swan. This is a real classic, the black swan. If I had anything to do with it, I was the dean of the business school here, I had every student read the black swan because once you started reading it, you wouldn't want to put it down. Written by a genius named Nassim Tlaib, and the subtitle is The Impact of the Highly Improbable. In 2007, he wrote the book. I, myself, I'd never talked to Warren Buffett in my life, nothing. But I sent him the book, I thought, the book had just come out. I thought he would really be interested in this book. And lo and behold, I don't know how he had time to write a personalized note thanking me for sending them The Black Swan. The Black Swan comes about because in Australia, uh, centuries ago, there were only white swans. And one day, a black swan appeared out of the blue. And that's where he got the, the uh, title, The Black Swan. And The Black Swan... It's just these, the, the, the latest financial debacle is a black swan. There's no question about it. What, what happened, the heaviest recession ever in the United States and so on. Um, it's now a generic name. Schwab and Company just talked about the black swan having to do with oil prices. It says, Nisim Tlaib has devoted his life to immersing himself in problems of luck, uncertainty, probability, and knowledge. Uh, he now is the only dean's professor in the sciences of uncertainty. You've never heard of a chair of the sciences of uncertainty at MIT. His latest book, The Best Seller, Fooled by Randomness, is published in 20 languages. And you look at some of the titles of the chapters, they're priceless, experts in empty suits. He says you got all these experts around, they're really empty suits, if you could know what they did in prior predictions, you'd just be astonished how poor they are at predi predicting just for the fun of it. Take Google and Google Bernanke of the Federal Reserve. You will never find any important prediction he's ever made that's come true. Whether it be the housing market he said was in fine shape a few years before it crashed, it goes on and on. About six or seven different turning points in the economy wrong all the time. And by the way, um, as Nisan Tlaib would say, he's now predicting interest rates in 2014 and have you believe that they're going to hold interest rates at these low levels until 2014. But when you think about it, it's just a travesty of justice that this man would have the goal to make a prediction like that. And then another chapter, nobody knows what's going on. Well, literally, in government, they don't. We just can't predict. He says we just can't predict. And here he goes on and on. He's very mad at all the forecasters. He says, once again, beware of forecasters. And th this last one's priceless. Anyone can become president. That's what he says. Um, yeah, right here I'm looking at Schwab. Black, black swans and crude oil. It's a generic name now. When, when an unusual, like the the uh, Japan incident on nuclear power, is a black swan of its kind. I mean, this is an event that you really can't, nobody, almost nobody can foresee. Okay, now I have three predictions that you can take to the bank that even Mr. Talib would agree with me. And think about it: mortality. I'm not going to disagree with that. Taxes. Oh yes, taxes. Yes, they'll continue going up like they usually have in every country over the years. And inflation, that you can take to the bank. Almost every country in the world 
has had different bouts of more inflation than low inflation. I just want to talk a little bit about taxes and the similarity to IRS tax reporting and general accepted accounting. For example, general accepted accounting, Price Waterhouse used to advertise they had a library of about 5,000 pages of accounting rules, regulation, dictum, and so on. Well, the IRS is now up to 70,000. You've got 70,000 IRS, 70, IRS pages covering all the regulation. So look what you have with the taxpayer. If everybody in this room hypothetically earned $500,000 in the years to come, they had the same family, everything, nothing was changed. I say that almost all of you would pay different taxes because of the tax code and is your preparer, the tax preparer going to be aggressive, middle of the road, or conservative, you see? Or is the taxpayer in guiding the, uh, the accountant, is he going to guide him towards being aggressive, conservative, or middle of the road? More, more, more taxpayers than you think are too conservative because these rules are just so complex. They lead themselves open to all kinds of loopholes. There's gray areas. Now go on the accounting now. This is where the outside accounting is really hampered. The generally accepted accounting with all the rules, regulation, on top of one another. And then this leads, of course, to all these loopholes and gray areas. So you got a very good similarity here between IRS reporting and GAAP. Now I'm going to go on to the greatest individual. Warren Buffett literally is the greatest collector ever of companies, you know, businesses. He also is on the side a great collector of individual companies. But the greatest collector of all was Shelby Cohen Davis and the Motley Fool and Tom Gardner, who heads up the Motley Fool. He told me to read this book. And this wasn't too many years ago. I just wish I could roll back the clock on investing. There's only one way I've invest. I've tested this out. It seems to work. But you're going to have to ride the ups and downs of the market. Shelby Cohn Davis borrowed $50,000 from his wife in about the 30s and left $800 million when he passed away in about 87. 800 million, but he owned 1,800 stocks. 1,800 stocks of which he ever sold. He never sold a stock. Many of those stocks collapsed, but it didn't matter because some of them just went through the roof. And he bought, he said, instead of putting, he became very wealthy. He also was an ambassador in Switzerland. Um, he said, instead of buying one stock, I'll buy 10. So for a man like that, with means, because later on the family became wealthy, instead of putting $100,000 in, he put 10,000 in 10 times. In other words, not right away, but he bought 10 stocks instead of buying one stock. My biggest mistake was putting in too much money in one stock rather than going for the, for the 10 stocks. And he would buy in 1,000 share lots even after his portfolio had grown beyond $100 million. According to Tom Gardner, quoting Shelby Davis, the time to buy stock is when you had cash. The only time to sell was when you needed some cash, otherwise you held letting the big winners erase the effect of the losers. And here are the positive aspects of, this is an unpublished paper I wrote of Davis's style of investing, far outweigh any negatives. He never attempts to time the market. He can't time the market anyway. He'll periodically purchase a stock based on its merits, regardless of whether he believes it represents value. Regardless of whether he, be he believes it represents value, without worrying that the stock market is overvalued. Well, that's what he said. I think I disagree with that. But the reason, here's what he's saying. He, he would, even when the market turns out to be as high, he never stopped buying, just like he never stopped buying when the market reaches low because he never stopped buying. He never looked at the market itself as being too high, too low. He always dollar average. So that's where this comes in, where uh, even if he thought the market was inflated, it didn't bother him. Also, he never had to read an annual report. You can just imagine trying to wade through an annual report. He long before, early in his career, no longer was reading annual reports. Um, here's another one that's overlooked. This is where I bring in. 
I claim the more stocks you own, the more safety there is in numbers. If you own 100 stocks and the market crashes like it did recently, drops in half, even though all your 100 stocks, you've got to realize 100 stocks are going to go down. They're going to go down 50%. If you own 10 very fine blue chip stocks, they go down 50% temporarily. But psychologically, I claim the more stocks you own, when, the, when you have these down drafts in the market, which you have every once in a while, um, I think you're going to feel better than the average investor. Uh, here again, I say it's not no time. You don't have any time to read any reports. Um, if Shelby Colin Davis was alive today, I could interview him and only ask him one question. At what point in your investing career did you stop reading any reports? Uh, finally, there's a tax shelter here. Because you, by the time you adopt this strategy, you're going to find there's losers. There's, there's some losers in your portfolio. So if you do want to take profits, you can always take the losers in your portfolio and asset the profits. Now, I'll tell you where I've tested this out just over the years. Investors have asked me to look at their portfolio, and I tell them I'm never interested in the dollar amount. I'm only interested in the stocks, the names of the stocks. I've noticed investors who own, like my next door neighbor owns 40 high-grade stocks. He's never sold any of these stocks. Most of them are household names. Every once in a while, he'll ask, he says, is it time to sell? And I say, you know you're not going to sell. But your children, your children will inherit these stocks, and they, won't, they, they will not be able to sell them fast enough, some of them. That's what happens. Um, we have, my wife has a masseuse that comes for 15 years. Um, a masseuse, a great individual investor. He invests through Value Line. He now owns 80 stocks. It makes me envious. All these stocks he owns make sense. Some of them are speculative, but most of them you know, have been... Um, recommended by Value Line, which is a great publication for individual investors. Well, now I, I thank you for, for your attention and everything, and I can answer these questions. Yeah, just like we wanted a half an hour, and Professor Lawrence said he would try to call on every student. Well, thank you very much, Percy, for that very insightful and enjoyable hour and 25 minutes. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, what you're saying is um, you're talking about judging presidents by how the stock market's done. But you said there is a correlation. There is some. Okay, just I'm going to go down the list real quick. Looking at the price earning ratios only, because I believe if the price earning ratio doubles or goes up 50% like Clinton or 100% Coolidge, got to be positive on the market. I mean, I'm just saying that the presence had something to do with it. Well, if you know anything about Coolidge, uh, he was the president for the Times, you know, less regulation, all the rest of it. And the earnings were going through the roof. And the same thing with Clinton. Not that he had that much to do with it, but he certainly, as far as a Democrat, he was maybe more enlightened. I think taxes went down uh, to some degree, especially the capital gains tax. So here's the way I ranked them, Coolidge positive, Hoover negative, but Hoover was unlucky. See, he got the depression. Then we got Roosevelt was very positive. He was the optimist. He put through all those government programs. He declared a bank holiday. Everybody was taking their money out of the banks. He closed the banks for a month, and that stopped the run on the banks. You, the SEC was formed, by the way. There, there was no SEC. Um, as I told you, the market rallied fivefold right after he took office. And one reason it rallied, it wouldn't have rallied nearly as much if it hadn't been for Roosevelt. There's no comparison between a Roosevelt and a Hoover, even though Hoover was unlucky. If, if you just hear Roosevelt, hear his voice, all the fireside chats and so on, you can see something incredible. Truman was neutral, Eisenhower exceptionally positive, Kennedy neutral, Johnson negative, Nixon negative, but this is also because of their policies. They created more inflation, and this drove the market down. 
Ford, just by accident, maybe positive. Carter, very negative. Again, an unlucky president with the, uh, the economy. One thing Carter did, he doesn't take credit for us, he, he saved the day appointing Volcker. I don't know how a liberal president like that appoints the best chairman of the Federal Reserve we ever had, Paul Volcker. He deliberately raised interest rates to cut down inflation. It was really a brave move, brave move. Reagan was neutral, a big spender. He did lower taxes, but he raised taxes more than he lowered them. Uh, Bush won, uh, Bush's father, positive, Clinton very positive, the next Bush um, negative on the price earning ratio, but why wouldn't he be with the, what went on with the Iraq war and more inflation. And Obama, I put down Obama positively, not so much due to him, but due to Paulson and the Federal Reserve, because by the time 19, by the time 2009 came back, 2009, there were only two men running the country economically. One was Paulson, the other was Bernanke. Congress would, was just there to listen. They, had, they took control and they were out to save everything. Once Bear Stearns failed, which was merging the Morgan Stanley, but then Lehman wasn't merged. And when Lehman collapsed, they could see it was so intertwined with the global economy and so on, they could not afford another Lehman Brothers. And that's where Paulson where the big stimulus programs came in, and Bush was just a bystander on that. He was glad to do it, so was Congress. And Bernanke, who wrote a paper on the Depression, he's a student of the Depression, it's no accident that he is very liberal as far as creating more money. Um, a talk before the Chicago Economic Club about 10 years ago, he said through the electronic printing press, we literally can print as much money as we want, and that's where helicopter bin came on. Once in a while you see the helicopter bin dropping all these dollar bills through helicopters. And it's worked very well. It's not going to work forever. So I don't know if I've answered the question in a long-winded way. Oh, yeah, Professor, you should call on every, yeah. Uh, so you started your talk. My question was, you started the talk by citing three titans of the previous century, and I'm wondering who do you consider to be the expert today? Oh, okay, that's a good question. No, nobody. I, I claim there'll never be another. You gotta look. Ripley was a professor of political science from Harvard, but as far as nonstop criticizing the stock market and what was going on, and such a close influence on a president, this is the only time in the history of the United States where you had a president eligible to run for re-election with no scandals or anything. He couldn't miss and he voluntarily stepped aside. That's how much influence Ripley had. You're not going to find an economist, political economist like him. Who, who could predict the crash? It's true, he didn't predict exactly, but he was adamant the crash was coming. He said the whole corporate structure was rotten. Spot check. Boy, you look at public accounting. What, what partner today can go around the country for all these years? Every address was negative. Railroad accounting, he said, needed to be substantially improved. You name it. There was nothing about accounting he really liked. Who could get away with that today? The answer is no. No, you're not going to become a partner. And Professor Broff is in a category of his own because we're talking about academia. No professor in academia can really do what he's done. You've got these endowed chairs, endowed by accountants and so on, and also nonstop. Is any accountant from academia going to, going to attack head-on accounting and also through a big publication like Barron's? No. And you're talking about nobody. You could live 100 years now, you won't see people like that reoccurring. You've got many experts. They're good in their field and so on, but no, the Ripley... Spotcheck and Broff are in their own uh, category, just like Buffett is with investing. And you'll forget they've been right. You've got to realize Ripley was right. Everything Spotcheck said turned out to be true. He didn't even worry about inflation, what inflation would do to masking real increases in earnings. 
And you've got Professor Groff has been totally right about the permissive accounting, the lax accounting, which only gets worse and worse, and the lack of corporate governance. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, to recast your question, you're saying what's the importance of repurchasing stock versus emphasizing dividends? Is that it? Uh, and, and how do you find the best companies that tend to be purchased? Well, the ones that repurchase stock make it very public. It's more tricky today. What's very tricky today, when I wrote that book 25 years ago, stock options weren't that pervasive. A lot of times when management says we're repurchasing stock, Apple is a great example. we are repurchasing a, for the first time a lot of stock. But you know what? They're not going to have one more share less outstanding because it's going to replace these options. The options are pervasive now with the employees which they did not were not before. So you can have considerable dilution on the options of earnings. But many of these corporations, you don't find too many corporations that just repurchase stock per se that maybe don't have some options, a lot of options, but there are some out there, they publicly announce that I claim for the individual because the dividends, well the dividends are getting a big break now, the dividends are only taxable at 15 percent, but they've been taxed as high as 50 percent. Um, if Obama gets reelected, maybe, you know, the dividends will be taxed higher again, but I think if you have the cash available, and don't go into debt, that's the key, don't go into debt on Repurchasing, IBM is a great example. Look at the number of shares that have gone down with IBM. It's absolutely amazing. They've shrunk the capitalization by one-third over the years. So I believe, all things being equal, a corporation is better off buying back the stock. But in the case of Apple, and they're paying a dividend now for the first time, which is about 1.6%, but would have been almost 3%, but Apple's going up 50% in the last couple of months, um, I would prefer dividends from Apple and just buying, I would, at this price, it's not a high price earning ratio, I prefer a million to buy up enough stock to replace the options. I would not be in favor of Apple shrinking shares. They got a billion shares out. Selling at $600, it's the largest capitalization in the world. Oh, okay. Um, are you are you talking about the old Glass Siegel Act? Yeah, it was in nineteen ninety nine. You know, oh yeah, um, it should have never been repealed. It should have never been repealed. It was repealed because here again, both parties. Uh, nineteen ninety nine, Clinton was president, and they uh, they repealed it. Um, I'm in heavy favor. I think as they were saving these banks, they should have been broken up into many pieces. You mean the outlook for the future? Oh, okay. You you got an oligarchy, which is very not good at all. What's happened is, you know, that, that it's a farce to say they're not going to save these banks because the one liner is they're way too big not to save. They are way too big not to save. So the seven banks or six banks account for 70% of all deposits in America. Of course they're going to be saved. The only difference is maybe they'll be nationalized next time. You know, maybe like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you know, was taken over by the government. Nobody, you know, could have ever, ever bought it. I agree with this professor, you know, everything's opaque today. Nobody really knows what's going on with the banks. They can't afford to let you know. Uh, it's different than just a regular corporation. You know, it's much more complex. They're dealing with sums of money that could crater the economy, and they, they're way over leveraged. They got too much leverage. And I forgot to talk about short-term debt. You want me to take three minutes out for short-term debt? Okay, short-term debt is poisonous. You got to. 
I, on the balance sheet, the most important item I look at is short-term debt. Does the company have too much short-term debt? Here's a great example. The housing market, depression in America, was caused by too much short-term debt. The mismatch of taking short-term debt to buy long-term assets. A house is a long-term asset, even if you're going to live there seven years. So look at these people that bought these short-term mortgages, whereas before in the United States, they only had 30-year mortgages. That was it, 30-year mortgages, 20% down. Canada, it's interesting, Canada has had no problem at all because Canada, because this shows you what regulation will do. Canada held firm, 20% down, 30-year um, mortgages, and furthermore, if you turn the house back and owe money, you're personally liable. And so there is where short-term debt, all these subprime mortgages, we're talking about five-year adjustable debt, is just poisonous for they give you 5% interest, and then five years later you convert, and the interest rates go up. Um, acquisitions, some, some of these companies, Rite Aid, have you ever heard of Rite Aid? The, the guy who inherited the company from his father, this huge pharmaceutical chain, he was making acquisitions with short-term debt, and it just uh, overwhelmed him. So the commercial paper market, like I say, General Electric got cut short, Many of these companies had commercial debt, commercial debt, commercial debt paper because it's lower interest. See, another thing that worries these corporations is short-term debt, they pay less interest. But then what happens is, if there's a mismatch between the short-term debt and long-term long -term assets, they they're really, uh, really have problems. So I forgot to address the, and by the way, the world now is awash. Everywhere you turn between the United States, the sovereign debt, the maturity of our debt's only five or six years. We have to turn over all our debt, which is about close to $15 trillion every five years, much too high. Europe is a wash in short-term debt. Um, that's why you have all the quantitative easing throughout the world and artificially low interest rates. And you got, by the way, Tlaib just made the front page of the English Spectator, and he predicts quantitative easing will break England. England's also engaged in, in massive quantitative easing. That's it on debt. <laughs> oh, okay. One stock, the Negamon, one stock on Pazamon. Is that it? And that beat your expectations in 2011. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's 2012 now. <laughs> okay. Okay. In answering the question, let me tell you where you got to be careful. The price earning ratio, there's three price earning ratios. One is 12 months. The other is this coming year. Let's say we're in a calendar year. You can use 12 months, some of them use, which is ridiculous because that's the past. You can use December of this year, the price earning ratio. But every um, major investor, any, every institutional investor I've ever known, and myself as an individual investor, right or wrong, you can be very wrong, but I'm, I'm going 2013. To me, it's the price earning ratio for 2013. Right now, the Dow is at 13 times earnings for the year. It's, it's 12 times earnings for next year. Um, you asked me about a stock that I'm negative on, right? Okay, I'm trying to think. You know, you know why? I'm trying to think hard of that because I can give the one that I'm so positive on. To me, it's such a no-brainer that nobody really discusses. It's kind of like Apple computer, but not the same. You know, Steve Jobs, nobody says that the company's better off without Steve Jobs. They really are. Steve Jobs was a tyrant. He never gave anybody else credit. These products that they came out with were really a team effort. They weren't just, it's true, he was a genius. He came in, he saved Apple. No question about it. But it really, I hate to see what happened to him medically, but it's really great that Cook took over. He's raised the price earning ratio. He's raised a very slim price earning ratio. I mean, it was nine times earnings, now it's 12 times earnings. Paying this dividend is long overdue. Jobs would sit on 200 billion of cash and still not pay a dime of dividend. And this company now is sitting on 100 billion. That's Jobs. Uh, it's no accident he closed down the charity. The charities that Apple Computer contributed to, Jobs closed him down. He was, he was a very tough individual to get along with. The morale wasn't good there. So I'm just giving an example, analyzing 
a personage that um, is running a company. Now we have Warren Buffett, to me one of the great all-time buys. I'm looking at book values, Warren Buffett. It's just a no-brainer. Warren Buffett is a little bit like Jobs, but not, not personally. Um, he hasn't paid a dividend. He probably, as long as he's living, he's about 81 now, he's never going to pay a dividend. He's never split the stock. He does have a separate class, Class B. I think the main stock, uh, he was $120,000. What's the main stock sell for? Class A. Anyway, Buffett, when Buffett's gone, this I predict is going to happen. It's the most positive thing that's ever happened to the company. He is a genius at what he did. He's overlived his time there. The businesses, that the, the incredible business that he owns, I think will go public in their own right. The Burlington Northern he bought will go public again. You'll own shares of Burlington Northern. You'll own all these pieces of the greatest business empire ever put together. General Re, the, one of the largest general reinsurance companies, Geico, the largest uh, insurance, auto insurance company. And it just goes on and on. Even Seize Candy. Seize Candy go public in its own own right. So what's going to happen? He's going to pay a dividend, no big deal. He'll split the stock. They'll, they'll finally put the stock, maybe come down to $50 a share. But the big deal is just like AT&T. By the way, when AT&T was forced to split up, you got all the baby bills with it. One great way of investing is when you get hold of a company that's become like a huge conglomerate or something, and now they're going to start spinning off companies. That's what happened to ITT. ITT under Janine went downhill. Uh, another a West Pointer took over. He was very stubborn. He said, I'm never going to get rid of any of these companies. But what happened, slowly, ITT distributed about 10 companies. You can imagine the, gr the great increase in wealth from these 10 companies rather than just having one ITT. That's why I'm very excited on Berkshire Hathaway to answer your question. <coughs> I wish I was young enough to be around for the finale. Yeah, that's a good question because what I failed to say is every footnote you hear again, you want to look at them negatively. What are they trying to hide? If you're going to look at these footnotes optimistically, you're going to lose out. And I would lose customers. The customers just couldn't take the negative research. They didn't care how accurate it was. The research was being constantly laundered. One time, 15, 15 different companies wound up with my research laundering it to the analysts. Even the buy side analysts, who are supposed to be less biased, um, complain. It, was, it, it didn't look good with their bosses because my main supporters were the people running the money and so on. So, you, and they said, you're a cynic. You're too cynical. And I said, look, the definition of a cynic is you, you better look both ways when you walk down a one-way street. And a good, friend of, a good friend of mine was killed not too long ago, not looking both ways. So, you you want to look at deviation from the norm. Everything is deviation from the norm. Every footnote you look at, you don't know what it may, may be. It may be in the president's letter. It may be like made off with this feeder fund. Um, you want to look incrementally up and down. How much did it affect incrementally up and down? When you get to the capitalization footnote of Enron, 100 times earnings, they go from 90 cents to a dollar. 10 cents comes from capitalized uh, software, you don't need to know anything more. You don't need to know to go further. It's the deviation up and down. It can be positive. Inventories. I used to look at inventories, raw materials. You've got to build up in raw materials, but not as much as a build up in goods and process and final inventory. That's a very positive factor for getting ahead of the market. Usually that company's going to have better earnings than you think because they have a big build up in raw materials. I don't know if I answered that. So when we have companies that are 
services, financial services, should we consider the quality of the financial team? When we're looking at financial services, we look at the quality of the financial service team. Oh, you mean who's running the company? Oh, that's a great question. Who's running the company? Is he a tyrant? I mean, oh boy. See, it, it yeah, I say analysis it probably starts it. You, you, the problem is you can't look inside. Like, who knows? From the outside, Meg Whitman's 50 pounds overweight. She's got a very bad temper. Um, she was subject to a lawsuit by an employee, grabbing an employee by the collar. The, collar, the employee was later rehired. You know when she was running for governor about the maid and all that. And I think she told the maid, you're fired by email or something like that. Um, that's why you got to be careful. Now, now Hewitt Packard's awful depressed, but I would, I would duck that stock alone. I hate to criticize Peg Whitman. By the way, she's already missed the numbers. Um, I don't get eBay going into Hewitt Packard. I mean, that is so important. If you looked at Skilling, was another tyrant, the way he would curse out analysts in public, which is a very poor sign. Um, the guy that ran Sunbeam. Um, oh, here's a great one, Don Trump. Don Trump, I don't know if it has any companies public, but let's say he had a big conglomerate public. I've never invested in it because of Don Trump. I'm just saying because he, he's just so egocentric. That's a very important element, but hard to determine from the outside. Does the guy have a medical condition that's hidden? I'm not talking about jobs. He made it public, but he could have a medical condition that's affecting him. You've got to realize another thing that weighs against you. The board of directors are puppets. They are puppets. Um, I think I was asking Professor Lawrence, does anybody here know of one outside corporate director of any large corporation that voluntarily during this financial debacle said, I am leaving, either I don't like the way they're keeping the books, I don't like the way the controls are, I don't like maybe what management's doing. I don't know of one outside corporate director. Now, they might have left because of health, they might have been kicked off the board, whatever like that, but not just voluntarily. That's how bad it is. Did this answer it, kind of? So just curious, so considering some of the quantitative easing you've done last few years, what do you expect to see like in inflation in the next five years? Oh yeah, that's a subject in itself because um, just just like the contract, whoever renders you the contract has got the upper hand, whoever prepares the statistics has got the upper hand. They're going to distort those statistics in their favor. So look at the current rate of inflation. It's supposed to be two or three percent, which is nonsense. Bernanke only looks at core inflation, taking out energy and food. I believe he takes out energy and food. I wish he was here tonight just for one minute. I'd ask him, Professor Bernanke, do you drive a car? Do you consume energy? Do you have any tuition you pay? You have to pay tuition. What about rentals? The consumer price index has rentals, not the cost of housing anymore. Rentals have gone up more as the housing has plunged. Rentals have gone up more inflation-wise. Also, medical has gone through the absolute roof over the years. So it's just pretending that inflation is only 2 or 3%. There's a publication out that takes these numbers apart that claims the real rate of inflation is 5 or 6, which it is. The real rate of inflation is probably 5 or 6. You could have seminars on how they have downplayed the inflation over the years. They've changed the consumer price index. Nixon publicly cursed the Department of Labor that prepares the uh, consumer price index as inflation is starting to rise. He said, can't you people, these were his Ehrlichman and Haldeman, he said, can't you stop these people in the Bureau of Labor from going too high on the Bureau of Labor statistics. We may change the employment numbers if I'm president. Under um, Clinton, what did he do? He took, if you are no longer employed for 12 months, but you're still maybe looking for a job, you're no longer classified as unemployed. You see what I mean? Constantly these statistics are rigged in favor of the preparer. You ask me the outcome on this, I gotta go along with Tlaib because it's the same thing in the United States. He says quantitative easing is a transfer from the poor to the rich. 
savings have been decimated. Uh, nobody can get any real return on savings. This forces people into commodities, the stock market. This is one reason why the stock market stands so well, because these are artificially low rates. I could go on and on. The ending will not be good. The weight will collapse of its own. They'll call on the IMF. The IMF will do what they do in Greece. They'll raise taxes. They'll cut spending. The pensions will go down. The same thing will just going to be repeated, like in the United States, we're not being immune anymore than what's happening in these other countries in Europe, one way or the other. Are you talking about the dot-com boom in the emails? She's saying one of the most important chapters, she, one of the chapters she liked was don't trust your analysts. Yeah. And as an individual investor, she's working 60 to 80 hours a week. Well, and then what individual investor doing what? She's working 60 to 80 hours a week. Yeah. So, so how do you find, how do you detect good analysts? You, you say you're working 60 hours a week and she's looking for a good analyst? How do you differentiate good well, um, <laughs> I would read value line for investment ideas. These these researchers come up, they cover the companies very well, but you just got to realize they can do very well on the way up, they can kill you on the way down. Um, there are analysts, independent analyst organizations that much more today have independent research entities. They're not tied down to banks, brokerage firms, and so on. And the problem is they sell their research, see the research for sale, so the public doesn't really have access to it. Um, yeah, it, the individual investor is, is up against it in more ways than one. Everything, the, the accounting, the regulation, you name it. Uh, it's, it's, see, this is why I, I paraphrase Shakespeare. I said, the stage remains the same, only the actors change. And when you look at the Ripley and the spot check and the bro up, you're, you're really just seeing, the stage is really the same. It, the, the subtitle of this book, how the investor is being fleeced through generally accepted account. Value line is what you recommend? I highly recommend value line. This personage, we know this individual, the masseuse that owns any socks, every one of his ideas that come through value line. Now, I subscribe to value line, which also has small companies. They have they analyze 1,600 companies. It costs about $400 a year. They analyze another 800 smaller companies. Um, all I do is when I, they come out every week, with new coverage, and they rotate it every three months. They give you new coverage on each, I mean, current coverage on each company every three months. They upgrade it. And I just look at names I'm familiar with, and you know, some of the investment ideas I've gotten through value line. Um, I missed two recently, I missed two trading opportunities. The January 6th issue of value line talking about Apple Computer. Apple was selling at 400, and it told you that the, the, the most recent quarter disappointed Wall Street. The stock didn't go down that much. It said they're going to have a great quarter next. They did. The result is it's going from 400 to 600. Then they talked about Seagate Technology. I'm just giving you an example of Seagate Technology was 17. They're in the hard drive business. There's been floods in Thailand. They did not get affected by the by the uh, by the uh, floods. Their competitors did. It said the earnings will be way above Wall Street expectations. The earnings were just sensational, and the stock went up 50 percent. There's two I miss. I'm just telling you, just on a trading basis. I think it's eight o'clock, okay. and I think we're over. One more question? Are you? Are you? We should probably. One more question. In the back.
So she was saying that recently Citibank underwent the stress test and it failed it. And oh, okay. There's a great question. Yeah, here we. Let me bring you in the real world. We've had no. We've had stress test after stress test for years now, including Europe, ever since you know the financial collapse. The stress tests are all rigged. They, when you think about it, they got to be rigged to a degree. There was this big bank in Belgium in the last six months, a big bank in Belgium, maybe the largest bank. It had a stress test that was positive. It collapsed. The look here again, you got to look at the real world. Even I, I have to say this. If I'm stress testing a bank and I have, I'm a regulator, you know, I can't afford to tell too much. I, I cannot go into in detail about the internal controls. I'm going to bust the stock. So the stress tests have to be rigged. And obviously, the European Union has constantly rigged the stress tests, and so has the United States, for practical and necessary reasons. <laughs> oh. That brings us then to our evening. Thank you so much. We give a big round of applause. And here, so what do I do with this? Here. And as a former Haas graduate, hopefully oh you accept some small something from us here. Thank you but very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, boy. Kind of like our last.